So I think we're back on. Welcome, welcome back, everybody. Excuse me, just a moment. Um, I just want to, just a note to George, who's kindly hosting and taking care of things tonight. If George, if at any point it doesn't seem like I'm loud enough, um, or you know, in any way the 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 sound is messing up or or the image, please feel free to just sort of interrupt me. You know, but the thing is, I I'm not actually going to be looking at at the screen because my camera is separate. So if you were to um, say something, for example, in chat, I'm, I might not see it. So please feel free to just kind of let me know. In fact, right now, is sound and image okay? Yes, everything's been wonderful. Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you so much. Great. Okay, so um, actually, I just want to comment on uh, some very, some very nice um, comments in the chat. Thank you so much. And somebody said, my sore back feels so much better. <laughs> I'm so happy to hear that. And somebody, somebody was asking about anger and that anger came up and they felt it was sort of uh, like, um, how should they uh, stop, get away from the anger and get back to the restfulness. But you know, the, the point about the welcome is the anger's welcome. It's, it's not something to kind of get rid of this. We're, 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 we're developing, I am going to give a talk by the way, but I just want to address this question. We're developing this capacity. We're opening up, we're developing our capacity to open up to a kind of awareness that knows how to welcome all of us. I could put it like that. And that would include anger. You know, anger actually is part of our human makeup. It's going to come up at times. It's uh, from the point of view of this kind of awareness that we're just beginning to explore. Um, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. It's welcome. Anger's not a problem. I mean, it certainly feels like it. It can be very uncomfortable. And many of us are kind of uh, conditioned to, you know, uh, to, well, we can have various kinds of relationship with anger. You know, some of us, for some of us, it's, it's really a no go zone. We were trained as kids not to get angry and we did get angry. You know, we naturally did this. So we, we, we learned to suppress it and then we kind of get afraid of it. Think it might be so explosive. It's dangerous. And others are habituated to sort of getting angry very easily with some kind of defense of some kind, you know. Um, but actually, um, from from the sort of deep point of view of the, the Dharma, of the sort of great reality, we're, we're coming to know better through our practice. It's not a problem. It's just one of the many threads in the fabric of existence, you know. Um, okay, so... I want to give a talk um, on um, huh, basically two sort of views, perspectives on suffering. Um, those of you who were here last time, oh, that's the wrong way around. When I was here last time, those of you who happened to hear me, um, speaking will may remember or not that I I talked about um, this sort of image from early Zen in China from about the fifth century CE. You know, Buddhism, as I'm sure you know, developed in India around 2,500 years ago. Um, about 500 years after that, it started spreading out of India and into China and other places. And, and then um, by about the year 500 CE, uh, what came to be known as Chan Buddhism, which was a, a Chinese form really of the Indian variety, started to emerge. And that's what we know as Zen today. Um, because when Chan Buddhism subsequently sort of traveled to Japan, uh, the word Chan was pronounced or became Zen. 
And so really what those of us who are familiar with Zen are really doing is Chan. <laughs> it's Chinese Buddhism. It's, it's sort of Indian Buddhism with a flavor of Chinese kind of in there. And then with a flavor of Japan in there. And now maybe in the West with a flavor of the West starting to emerge. Um, but in the very early times of that articulation, that expression of the Buddhist Dharma, the Buddhist teaching, the, um, the ways we can come to know life through uh, developing in Buddhist practice, um, there was an image that, that, was, that came up as, uh, of a cart track. You know, a cart has at least two wheels, maybe four, you know, but anyway, two. And so it needs to have a rut for both of its wheels. So it has two ruts. And this image was trying to talk about different approaches to practice and saying primarily there are two, two ruts. The first image comes straight from Indian Buddhism and it's known as the four foundations of mindfulness. That's, that's, the, that's rut number one, four foundations of mindfulness. Some of you, I, I don't know how you know, deeply into Theravada or Vipassana or any form of Buddhist practice, you know, you've all gone. I think some of you will have gone quite deeply. Others, maybe a little less so, more on the sort of uh, uh, Rick's fantastic sort of neurological and psychological side, you know, showing how the practice uh, uh, is, 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 uh, is, uh, understanding our neurology. Uh, he's such a brilliant at uh, sort of marrying the practice to neuro neurological, under neurological science, you know, neurological understanding, seeing how really they're so close. It's, it's so wonderful that this is being so clearly articulated by people like Rick. I think he's a great leader in that area, actually. But anyway, on, uh, on this track, no, sorry, rut number one, we're talking about developing our mindfulness, our capacity to be in and with the experience of this moment as it is in a more accepting way, basically, you know, and that's not the end of mindfulness, but it's a sort of critical um, development in our, in our approach to our life, because in order to be able to be aware of what's arising right now, that must mean both around, both around us and within us. And to be able to become more cognizant of the processes of me being me, what that it really is and what that feels like and what it sounds like because of the chatter in the mind and what it looks like because of images in the mind, as well as the things I see around me, to become more cognizant of this is, and more able to let it be as it is, is a fantastic development in sort of tolerance, the window of tolerance of experience. We're growing our capacity to be able to hold experience as it is. That means we're, when our capacity is narrower, when our window of tolerance is narrower, we're going to be much more reactive because if things come up that we can't tolerate, bang, we got to react to them. We got to quickly change things. And that might mean lashing out or it might mean running away, you know, the fight, flight responses or, you know, the, the, the nervous system fired up to do one or the other, or freeze, as we know. So as we're growing in this capacity to be with things as they are, and to be more cognizant of them, to be more aware of what's actually going on, you know, we are growing in our capacity to choose how we respond and maybe to choose to live more skillfully, which means in Buddhism, wholesomely, which again means in Buddhism, less harmfully. 
it means with more likelihood of encouraging well-being for self and others, basically. There are kind of different levels of that, of what that well-being might be. And on one level, it's talked about as worldly well-being. And then there's another level, which is talked about as non-worldly well-being, which is really when we're more on the path of renunciation, which means the path of letting go of uh, deep parts of our assumptions about who we are. And that's really the path toward awakening. Now that's that 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 in the entire path is of of from from sort of yeah this sort of developing our capacity to be with and to be less be, therefore becoming less reactive more responsive more helpful that's all on this track rut one now of four foundations of mindfulness it can take us all the way to this. Uh, great promise of Buddhism, of practice, that there really is some kind of, what, expansive experience or something we may come to that is, in some sense, markedly a shift from how we normally have experienced things. And that that shift is marked, among other things, very often it's stead by uh, awakening from attachment to the self I thought I was. It's about waking up from an idea of who we are and who we've always been. A sense of it also. I mean, it's not just an idea. It, it is multiple ideas and it's various kinds of sense in the body, which actually it turns out really a kind of subtle muscular contractions. Possibly that's all they are, you know. But together with the thoughts we have about who we are, um, they produce a very strong and convincing sense that I am who I am and I know who I am and it's who I've always been and always will be. And it turns out that actually with enough practice in rotten one, we can come to actually dismantle that sense of self. We can understand the processes that are engendering it and when it's got more light coming through when the pieces that make it are starting to come apart and light is showing up and space is showing up um, it's very beautiful and we have less attachment and contraction into being who we thought we were and man that is a great recipe for less suffering it's not that suffering when we won't come up, the situations will come back, we get tight again, we contract again, back into the sense of self is difficult, but we're getting a little more adept at knowing, oh, that's happened again. Okay, what's going on? Okay, so there's tightness here. Oh, there was that thought and that thought. Wow, yeah, okay, I'm starting to realize the pieces that create this sense of self. Ah, oh, and I can relax around it all and maybe open to a much broader, expansive sense of things that um, where the sense of self is less present, simply less, less, less up and arising, less present. Okay, now that's, that's all the sort of, we could call that, it often is called the gradual path of awakening. Rut number one. So this is, I'm coming back to this, Important notion, that get just to, to remind you, cart track, two ruts, Chinese Buddhism, early. They had this idea, rut one, just as, as just defined. Now, that's basically also, let me say, approximately the eightfold path in Buddhism. Most of the eightfold path. Perhaps all the way up to the seventh fold. And then maybe with the eighth fold, starting to get inklings of there's another rut. There's rut number two. Okay, this is this is where they see these Chinese approach slightly differed from the Indian, but not really, but sort of, because what they thought was, yes, great, we got this path of gradual development, gradual cultivation, which we all need. So there it is, like the cart, it's gotta have two wheels. 
Therefore, the track has has two ruts. By the way, we're really the cart. You know, the path is really the track is really the path of development and growth and uh, expansion and awakening. You know, that practice can offer us. Um, so, what is rut two? Rut two is well, ha! Huh, it's awakening. Rut two. You see, the thing about rut two is is even though we're doing this path of gradual cultivation, what they, these Chinese minds sort of knew somehow, probably through their Taoism, Taoist background, that the awakened nature of all things is always here. It's always present. Now, this is, um, I, I don't want to sort of scare anybody and make it all sound too weird or, I hope I'm not. Maybe I already have, but but it is a feature of uh, our, our, our human makeup that any of us at any time, in fact, may have some intimations that there's kind of a different order of things than we ordinarily think, and in that different order. Um, <clears throat> The ordinary way is not actually negated. It's not thrown away. It's just that sometimes we, we see in a, in a, or experience in a slightly different way. And many of us may have had inklings of this, intimations of this. It's, it, 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 it's characterized this other order of things, of experience. It's characterized by a few features commonly pointed to ones are, number one, a sense that in some strange way, all the separate things of this world actually have a kind of dimension to them where they're not separate. There's some order. I, I keep using the word order. Maybe, maybe it's not the best word, but there's some reality or level of experience or dimension aspect of things where actually they're all connected and not this is not a notion not an not an idea not an intellectual thing we actually feel suddenly that yes everything is sort of joined in some way and we may only get it just for a flash you know could be watching a beautiful sunset could be looking at a, a beautiful painting, could be uh, in the midst of, uh, well, sometimes it happens in the midst of very concentrated activity like sports. You know, surfers often seem to have inklings of it being one with the wave and that kind of thing. And, you know, and uh, 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 basketball players, pianists, um, um, Anybody in whatever activity it may be that is really engrossing may sometimes give us intimations of this. Now, the, these these states, you know, in activity are well studied and documented. There's famous uh, research on them from this guy, famous guy, Chikset Mihai, in the 70s and on. He called them flow states, and they're characterized by a sense of effortlessness, of timelessness, and of selflessness, that somehow the activity seems to be doing itself and doesn't sort of need us, you know, even though we're doing it. It's sort of, it's as if we're not there and yet it's going on. And, and, um, and, and often there's a sense, uh, it doesn't have to be actually, but often there is a sense of a sort of a boundlessness a boundarylessness. There's no boundary between me and what I'm doing. Somehow the environment seems to sort of almost become part of who I am. Or I, I sort of merge into it. That this is this is inklings of intimations of what the Chinese were calling rut number two, and the the name they gave it was Buddha nature. <laughs> Buddha nature, which you know comes from Indian Buddhism, Buddhism of course. Buddha meaning awakened, so it's awakened nature, meaning from their point of view that there's a nature to things 
which is already partaking of that, all being one. Somehow it's also a limitless nature, doesn't have clear, finite boundaries. And it's also, um, well, it has maybe one other sort of characteristic that we can experience, which is that somehow in it, um, it's not so solid. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of empty, is the Buddhist word, you know. That it's, and in the Chinese way of thinking, they call it absence. That there's an absence present all the time. <laughs> an absence that is present all the time. And this absence is actually the source of all experience. So all that we see, hear, feel, think, included thinking in this, is actually a kind of activity or functioning of this Buddha nature. Now, it's rut number two, it's part of the cart track because it's not actually something that we cultivate. It's a reality that's already here. And we're all we're doing in practice, if we're on the path of awakening, which we may well not feel we are and don't want to be, fair enough. We might just be on a path of healing and well-being. Very, very good. You know, that's absolutely right. I, I, but, you know, what I like about this image is that the two are not exclusive. There's two ruts to the track. We may be deeply committed to just getting more well-being. And that's a, that's a superb reason to practice. Uh, much of my life, my practice has been about that. I had a lot of healing to do, you know, still doing it, you know. And, um, and, um, but actually also <laughs> at any time, we may get sudden flashes of awake nature that is boundless, empty, and makes everything one. And so, um, on the other hand, even if we're, even if we've got like a bee in our bonnet about this awakening business, which many people do today, because, I mean, in the West, because, you know, there's a lot of, talk about awakening, waking up, non-dual experience, another term for kind of much the same thing, self-realization, realization, liberation, you know, enlightenment even. I mean, this is kind of entering our world in a way that it hadn't, it had probably entered a little bit, like let's say 50 years ago, 70 years ago. Yeah, it just little weird niche folks here and there kind of had an interest in it. But today it's becoming kind of more mainstream that really, you know, it, it's, it's, it's real and it's, it's here, it's around, it's present. And in our zeitgeist, in our culture, it's becoming kind of mainstream. So now some people, you know, damn, that's what I want. I want to really go for that. You know, some are like that. And so, okay, fine. You're on that path. But wait a minute, actually, you're on a path that has another rut. In other words, you may be pursuing awakening or decide you're going to do that or decide you are doing that. But actually, mm, you're a cart. You got this other side and this needs tending too. Because no matter how much we may awaken even and f find this glory of, you know, timelessness, spacelessness and all being one, fine, actually find that, you know, we can, and we can, we can uh, find it repeatedly, you know, but actually, hmm, there's another rut. Why? Because we're still a suffering human being. We're still the cart. We're not just one wheel. We've got two wheels. <laughs> so it's, I think it's quite a nice sort of balancing image. That if we, if we, if we're, if we only want, you know, let me just sort of uh, develop my mindfulness so I can be a little less reactive at work. Well, that's great. Absolutely. Nothing wrong with that. Fine. But, you know, 
you might just get hit by a sudden glimpse of something you didn't expect, you know. And I, 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 I venture the idea that quite a number of us here tonight may have at times indeed been struck by sudden intimations of another order of things. Quite good to know, therefore, that there's rut number two that knows about that and that there are, there are ways to actually develop our capacity to open to that. Okay. And on the other hand, let's balance it. If we're, if we're hammering for enlightenment, awakening, you know, we heard about it, we want it, we're sure we want it. You know, actually fine, but you're still a suffering human being. Let's not forget about that. So we want the balance of both. If we're, if we're really, um, interested in, well, deeper potential of our human nature. And how wonderful that to sort of be growing in that arena of human potential, be, to be opening in here and there, little ways, little releases, little openings, sometimes bigger ones, to be opening up to our human potential, that how wonderful that actually there's a, there's a world of wisdom called Buddhism, you know, and modern iterations of Buddhism that says to do that, all we need to do is come into stillness and rest And it will do the rest. <laughs> I, I didn't, sorry, I didn't mean there to be a sort of mini pun there that the rest will do the rest. I mean, actually, it's true. The restful, easeful, effortless state will do all that's needed to be done. We just have to trust it. So we come into this effortless place. and trust that what needs to unbind will unbind, that what needs to release itself will come up and show itself. And so, yeah, shadow material may come up. Good. And we welcome it. We're growing in our capacity to welcome and things release themselves and that effortless sitting can be the path it can be the way of growing in our expression of more of our human potential how amazing that it can just take sort of a, a, a trusting kind of rest. Okay, now, what about suffering? I said I'd say something about suffering. <laughs> Very much so. I mean, I think I have actually already, but just two views of it. Are you getting maybe some sense already maybe of how this would look? So from the point of view of our gradual development, in a way, we see suffering, I mean, fair enough, we see it as the problem. I mean, one of the blessed, beautiful, great gifts of Buddhism is that it puts suffering in the very center. It begins with suffering. You know, the very first utterance of Buddha's teaching, you know, in his first discourse, which was on the Four Noble Truths, truth number one, there is suffering. You know, compared with, it's just so simple that really all I want to do, he seems to be saying, is help us humans with this most central problem that we suffer. How can we come to understand suffering in such a way 
that we can suffer less. Suffer less. How can we, without any sort of ex external, extraneous, extra things, just coming to understand our suffering? What a caring, loving thing he, he did for us by putting it right at the start, right at the middle, right in the heart of the whole thing. Let's tend suffering. Now, with rut one, we're tending it by gradually understanding it, basically, and allowing it, and um, sort of bit by bit, not, I was going to say dismantling it, not exactly, but we have practices that help us with it, and gradually, gradually, we may suffer less, and at the same time, all the way, as we're becoming freer of suffering, we become uh, more of a helpful kind of offering in the world, more and more. And, and so, to the extent we help with our own suffering, we're going to be that much freer to help others with theirs, or create less suffering anyway, create more well-being, fertilize more well-being in this world. Um, rut one, rut two, it's slightly different. It is actually slightly different. Here, the view of suffering is a bit more like, like this. Um, I mean, it's still central, but actually, weirdly, from the perspective of awakening, uh, so I use the word a little reluctantly, hesitantly, but let me just see if I can just get this out and then we'll see if we need to unpack it a bit. But basically, from the perspective of awakening, suffering has been a kind of seed that something that had, had an intrinsic wish to break open, to germinate, break open and grow and bloom like a seed of a flower, that suffering was a hidden potential. And that through allowing it in the most beautiful way, it can kind of break open. You know, so the very thing that we find hard and is our suffering, many, many things, you know, but each one of them, if we, if we can welcome it, it may bring about an, a shift in us where we, our hearts open, our hearts break open and something beautiful shows itself. So from this point of view of rut two, I mean, let me give another analogy, maybe. Uh, suffering is the mulch in which the seed of self, the seed of egoic separate self, if the suffering's welcomed and allowed and not sort of disdained and pushed away and made an enemy of, if it's not made an enemy of, then the suffering can become a kind of mulch you know what I mean? Mulch sort of manure, you know, sort of fertile soil in which the seed of our sense of being a separate self can be nourished, can germinate, can break open and grow and bloom. So, um, you see, it's a different perspective. I mean, and is one more valuable than the other? No way. No way. Two ruts make one track. So now, why have I said all this? <laughs> well, mostly because I think the majority of you will be more familiar with um, Vipassana, Theravada, mindfulness practices than with things like crazy Zen which I'm more deeply versed in. I've done some 
some fantastic vipassana and theravada practice myself and a lot of mindful mindfulness trainings and practice as well but i'm more sort of deeply trained in zen and zen you know it really is a a two rut track <laughs> and so i want to i thought i would just sort of make sure that you're alerted to rut number two you know and 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 um, have some sense of how it relates to rut number one. Okay, now I'm actually gonna um, I'm gonna stop here, but I'm just gonna say that my this talk tonight, I think my my notion was that it would be like a sort of a kind of preparatory talk for next week, actually, when I'm I'm also gonna be teaching. Very honoured again that Rick is invited me to do this and I thought I would try to say a little bit about what I was asked just before we started actually somebody asked about what is a koan and you may have heard the term and many of you may not have heard the term doesn't matter next week I think based on what I've gone over tonight we'll be able to sort of start just dipping a toe in the water the wonderful wild water of the world of the koans the crazy things, koans. And um, yeah, so that's next week. We'll, we'll, we'll delve a little bit into that. Okay. Well, I want to thank you all very much for, for listening. And um, um, any questions, I'd be delight, delighted to see if I can, you know, uh, respond in some helpful way. I, I think maybe, um, George, in terms of questions, I know I sort of normally I think there's some that come in chat. And some um, actually are sort of uh, hands raised and people unmute. And I'm totally, uh, I, George, I can see you sort of uh, holding something up. I can't quite see. Actually, let me, let me just see. What, uh, I lost, okay, hold on. I lost control. Okay, I'm going to address that right away. Thanks for letting me know. Um, okay. Actually, it says your host on my, but you're not. Okay, so let me, how do I do this? I am still, excuse me, folks. I'm just going to try to figure this out. Um, okay. No, wrong one. Okay. Um, George, I can't, I'm trying to make you host. Okay, let me see. I think, hold on just a sec. I think it is a Zoom glitch. Aha, aha. Okay, okay. Thanks for letting us know. Okay, so actually, I mean, I can do it. Is, is that okay? I'll just, because I can see who's got hands up. Lee, Lee has hand up. So Lee, I'm going to, un. let me see if I can unmute you. I, th I think I probably, yep, I can unmute you. Well, I can ask you to unmute. I'm unmuted. I can hear you. Well, I just, first of all, want to say what a delight this has been. I am just thrilled. And just a real quick note, I spend my summers in Santa Fe. I think I am right down the road from you. So <laughs> I will get a kick out of coming and seeing you. Uh, I guess I've got a comment and, and, um, an absolute joy that you're going to address Cohen's. I will definitely be there for that. And uh, I guess the other comment I have is that I'm so grateful that you addressed uh, the, um, you are, you alerted us. I like that word. You're alerting us to, to these things and to, to let you know that, uh, that there are probably many of us that uh, that are right in there with the interconnectedness of all things. Oh, I'm, I just yeah. love that with nature, with all beings, with the earth, with the cosmos. So, yes, yay you! <laughs> Good talk. That's that's really all I've got. It's not a question. It's just a 
oh. absolute enjoyment of the talk and oh. thank, thank you. you thank you so much thank you so much um very very much appreciated um now lucy i i can ask you to unmute lucy kenyon Yeah, thank you so much, first of all, for your wonderful talk and you know, very, very inspiring approach to this. Um, but I have to say, right at the end, I got really confused. I don't know if I misunderstood what you said or if I misunderstood on a much deeper level. But you're talking about suffering becoming like a fertilizer for a sense of a separate self. And I'm thinking, why? <laughs> Isn't that what we're trying to get away from, the strong sense of a separate self? So why are we wanting to uh -huh. encourage that to grow? Or did I even yeah. hear what you said? Yeah, yeah. Okay, very good point. And let me, if I can just paraphrase it, I think the, the question is like, what sort of a, why would we want a sense of a separate self to disappear or something like that? Wouldn't we want it to grow strong and something like that? Is that about right? No, I, I thought you said you you wanted it to make you know the idea is to make it grow stronger. Okay, let me let me see if I can address that. Is it is my understanding all along has been we don't really want to dwell in the separate self. We want to. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. That was my, yeah, I, I get where you're coming from. Okay, let me, let me just, uh, I didn't, I think I may not have explained my metaphor very clearly. So let me see if I can do that. Thank you very much, Lucy. Um, so, so the way I was understanding it was like, um, actually, the sense of a separate self, when I said it can break open, that's like the way we, what we thought we were breaks open. And we find that, we, we are that, but we're also so much more. We're, we're part of everything. So in other words, that's the kind of blooming I was talking about. In some, in some traditions, they talk about the mind flower blooms, that actually this, this shin right back here, this, this shin is, is this, uh, this character, beautiful shin, it, a heart, heart mind, opens, and we discover that we are where instead of being isolated, separate, which we can still be as much as we want actually after awakening, you know, but instead we're also part of everything, one with everything. We're, we're not separate. So that's the kind of bloom I was talking about. So I get you. I didn't make that very clear. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. One more. I think this will be the last. Uh, Talbot, I'm going to ask you to unmute, please. Hi, Henry. Thanks for, can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Uh, thanks for uh, this wonderful, insightful talk. I uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, just have a comment slash question. Is it fair to say like the, the second rut of awakening is uh, similar to like this notion of, of, of being? I've heard this recently and it really resonated with me and I've felt it more about this notion of being and not doing as much because i've like you know there there are these instances where like someone says meditate and and there can be this this focused need to like work 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 at it and sometimes when you when you just don't work and just let things stay at it as it is it suddenly hits you like a jolt and i've heard this expressed as like something which you cannot get to but it's like the analogy is like the grace of god has to touch you to get to that state so it might take time in some cases but it comes to you like a joy a <laughs> yeah. gift so to speak yes 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 that's beautiful thank you so much for for bringing that up i think it's very much related actually there's a there's a a way in which um by us relinquishing our effort, our, th our trying, our doing. By the way, this is not the only gateway, but it's one gateway, is falling back, resting back into just 
being. That can open us up to a greater sense of being, to a wider being that actually somehow is all inclusive. So it's like a, so there are different, um, there are different doorways. They say there are 84,000 doors. So <laughs> no end of doors. So that's very lucky. You know, if one door doesn't open, doesn't matter. There's 83,999 other ones, you know, so <laughs> we're going to find a way. But one very nice one is this doing less and just being. Because when we're just feeling what it's like to just be, we might just find that that effortless being, it's like our own effortless being can sort of suddenly find it's part of a great effortless being. That's, that's kind of, and it can be really like a jolt. You're absolutely right. And, the, the, and, and I think it also, grace is not an inappropriate word here. And uh, sometimes in, 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 in Zen, Chan, you know, they, they talk about lightning. You know, you suddenly get struck by lightning, you know. No. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. Now, I can see there's more hands. I'm so sorry that we've reached um, 8.32, uh, 7.32 Pacific time. So it's time to stop. And um, I, I need to uh, hand over uh, to, uh, to George or to Tom, maybe. Um, and I'm going to say that um, maybe, you know, those of you who, if you're able to come next week, those of you who wanted to ask questions, you know, by all means, you know, you could uh, uh, bring them up next week if you're able to come. And if you're not, I'm so sorry um, not to be addressing them now. Um, but thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody, for your very kind. Um, I've seen so many kind comments. I haven't really had a thorough look, but I have seen some oh, very nice comments in the chat. It's very heartwarming. Thank you so much. So next week, those of you who can make it, we'll, we'll sort of uh, continue into exploring the, the two-rut track. Yeah, with cards. Thank you so much.